Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Saul Estrin. I'm the um, head of the Department of Management here, uh, and I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, you tonight to this uh, um, uh, Triam public lecture. Uh, just to explain for one moment to those who aren't aware, Triam is a, uh, an executive uh, uh, MBA, a global uh, MBA, uh, which is offered jointly. It's called Triam because it's offered jointly by three schools, HEC in Paris, uh, New York uh, University uh, Stern School, and Nunn School of Economics, and it's been going, I think it's about to come up for its 10th uh, year. Um, and these are events, as, uh, uh, this event is one of uh, a number of events we're putting on uh, over the next 12 months uh, related to uh, the success of uh, this, this, this uh, degree. And I believe we have uh, some uh, current and former mem uh, members of the uh, Triumph cohorts uh, in the audience tonight. Well, I'm very uh, pleased tonight to, to uh, um, welcome uh, Vineet Nayar. Uh, uh, Vineet is, is um, CEO uh, of HCL Technologies, and uh, well, you can all see um, what he's going to be talking about. He's done a very interesting thing. We've been talking about it upstairs in his organization. He's, he's turned around the regular way of thinking about the organization and, and started working from the resources within the firm and, and the skills that are within the firm and turned that into a way of thinking about and running the organization. Um, he's going to speak to us for um, um, I have around half an hour and then I hope we'll have a half an hour for questions. Uh, he's very keen, I think, to hear um, things from you. So that'll, while he's speaking, you can all be working out what you're going to uh, ask him. So with no more ado, let me hand over to him. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> Good evening. Let me try again. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, so let's start this differently. Why are you here? <laughs> Anybody? Okay. Anybody else? What? What? Yeah. Um, to know the impact on customers when they know that um, okay. we put them in second place and employ in the first place. Okay. Why are you here? Somebody else? Good, 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 good. Somebody else? Why are you here? Investment bank with a non-banking. Okay. Okay. Good, 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 good. Somebody else, why are you here? Investment bank with a non banking. Okay. Okay. Somebody else? To see whether this can be replicated across the industry. Okay. It's not unique to LCL. Okay. Anybody else? Very good. Okay, good. What else? To find out what happens to your bottom line after you've done it. Yeah, what happens to your bottom line after you've done it. Okay, good. What else? So what do you think is happening here? Right? To find out what, what is it that you want to hear and align, align it to what you want to hear. 
If you don't align to, to what you want to hear in the audience, then you're going to get, get it completely wrong. When you want to draw a line, right? You're very clear that you want to draw the line on the top hand right corner, right? That's where the line should end. How can you draw the line without knowing where are you going to start the line from? Yes or no? Most of the time in our organizations, we do not know where to start the line. And that is where we, we get it all wrong. It's like aging. When you look at the mirror every day, you do not realize that you have aged or you're aging. It's only once after 25 years or 30 years, you look at you know, somebody else and he says, oh, you look old. I mean, you don't say it, but you almost say it. You actually say, you look the same. I mean, you look, you know, we always say, it. you look the same. And because you're looking at yourself every passing day, you do not realize that you have become old. That's true with organizations. That's true with pyramids. That's true with structures. That's true with management styles. That they become old, they age, they become irrelevant, and we don't notice them. My analysis is that most of us are standing on a ledge of a burning building. And the only thing which is the truth about the situation is that we do not know that the building is burning. It's like the aging situation. And because of which, that the option of jumping from that building we do not exercise. And we keep standing on the building till we get engulfed with fire. And that's the reason so many very good companies die rather than sell themselves or transform themselves, predominantly because they do not realize that their position has become irrelevant and the only choice they have is to do something very different. So this experimental journey started with our realization that we have become irrelevant, right? It started in 2005 of the fact that our mind share, market share, talent share is reducing. We were trapped in our rear view mirror and most organizations are, right? Especially for people who have grandmothers and grandfathers, and I love the stories my grandfather used to tell me about how the world was when he was young. And those were fascinating stories, but they were what I call trapped in the past. Most organizations are trapped in the past in their historical glory. What happened 10 years ago, five years ago, 30 years ago, and so were we. We are a 32-year-old company with 70,000 employees, 93 nationalities, 26 countries, $3 billion of revenue. However, we were trapped in 2005 in our past glory that we were the first to do this and the first to do that and first to do this. And there were, you know, in any organization, if you think hard enough, you will find a lot of first. And we were trapped in the past. It is very interesting that, you know, I have been born and brought up in India, and a lot of time, a lot of people used to tell me, which is very interesting when I look back, that the British Raj was a much better Raj, right, than what the politics we have today. And the reason that statement intrigues me is because it is only when Mahatma Gandhi came in and showed the mirror to the, to the world and saying, you know, you can be free. And in absence of somebody showing that mirror, people were comfortable with what they were. Same is true with South Africa. Same is true, you know, till Nelson Mandela came and showed the mirror. And same is true with the US, till Martin Luther came and showed the mirror. A lot of us believe in status quo and believe status quo is the best position we, we can be and do not want to change. And that was true with HCR. The other view which is very interesting for us to think is that when we look at transformation and when we look at that now that we know that we are not you know, the prettiest of all, mirror, mirror on the wall, we're not the prettiest of all, we're the most irrelevant of all. Even if you take a decision to transform, the question which you know, comes to all our mind is how do we transform? How do we transform as an individual? How do we transform as a company? And if you look at the literature which is written, uh, at least I've read a lot of literature which is written on this subject, most of it is not practical, most of it is not implementable. Because those are, you know, whether you take core competence, whether you take the bottom of the pyramid, whether you take any of this literature, in parts they're exceptionally brilliant thoughts, 
But practically to implement in an organization which is 70,000 people long, it's, it's, it's pretty tough. So the second question comes is that when you want to transform, how do you transform? Because the purpose of transformation is to accelerate growth. The purpose of transformation is the fact that you're unhappy with your current state of being, whether you're a slave or apartheid or whatever it is, or you're a poor, slow-growing company, and you want to move to a fast-growing company. So the, the result of transformation has to be a faster growth. And there, in the transformation journey, you have two options. The option one is to transform what you do new product, new innovation, new services, and all this stuff, which is becoming more and more difficult with each passing day. How many Apples and how many Googles and how many Amazons do you see? For every one Apple, you see a million Apples kind of a products fail. The interesting other alternative, the blue ocean thinking on the other alternative, is not necessarily innovate on what you do, but maybe innovate on how you do it. If you look back to the 1980s, you would see the Japanese transform the way they ran the companies and easily could accelerate their growth compared to the auto and the electronic manufacturers out of the US. And the innovation which they brought to the table is not what their cars were or not what the electronics were, but how they run the company. And the entire Japanese management, which became hugely famous in the 80s and the early 90s, and unfortunately it failed because they stopped innovating on top of it, was a, a great learning experience that you can actually lead a transformation and an acceleration of growth, not by focusing on what you do, but for, by focusing on how you do it. So that is the background experiment which, which we were thinking about when we started the journey in 2005 and saying, you know, we are in a position which we don't like and we need to change. So I'm going to give you a few contours of this idea and then you know, dig deeper and deeper into, into this idea so that we can explore it in enough scale and size and then hopefully discuss and debate with you in, in an open forum. So the first idea is that <clears throat> how, how do you create transformation? So our first learning came from, you know, the revolutions which I talked about, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela and Gandhi. And my summary of the way they approached it is in three simple steps. Step one is to create dissonance and dissatisfaction with your today. Create a positive dissonance with your today. So, you, you know, the very fact that it is unacceptable for you to be apartheid or you, you to be a slave, most of our companies or most of us, actually you need to stop and think about it, spend so much time convincing ourselves that we are the best in what we do. Our marketing people convince us, we convince us, the mirror convince us, our friends convince us. And the, disson the positive dissonance does not get created in the fact that I'm unhappy with my current position or I'm unhappy with my current situation. If you are unhappy with your current situation, if you are happy with your current situation, why change? The journey of transformation would not start at all. So it's very important to create an unhappiness, which is what Gandhi did by showing the mirror that this is not what was meant for you. When Martin Luther said, this is not what meant for you. So that's the first step, is create a positive unhappiness with your current situation and get people away from the trap of rear view mirror. You see so many companies and they, you know, people publish book of the fact that what they did in the last hundred years. <laughs> now that's good for countries and history. I mean, I, I, wrote, a, I wrote a blog when President Obama came to India and the blog was titled that he was taken to Humayu Tom, which was, you know, a couple of centuries old, and saying there's no point of going there. What you have to go is go, have to go into the malls of India and see people wearing Nike shoes, people wearing Levi's jeans, people eating Pizza Hut, and people drinking Coke, and then ask yourself, is India creating jobs for U.S. or taking jobs from U.S.? So that's the critical question you need to ask. And that, you know, that, that got a lot of attention, but that's the point which I'm making. There's no point of looking in the rear view mirror. What you have to look at, you must understand, this is the first time in history a president of America came to India to sell commerce and went back saying that I have sold to India to create 50,000 jobs in U.S. It has happened in the first time, so the world is turning around. And therefore, there is no point, and the very fact that Obama came and he was very clear of why he came. He came to sell. 
He, he came to create jobs in America, and the only way he could create jobs is to sell more and more to India. And, and the fact that people are clear about it is that they are moving away from, they are not happy with their current situation. The second is to create a romantic future. <coughs> what is the romance of tomorrow? What is that compelling vision which will make you jump up and want to be there? You can be free, or you can be the most innovative company in the world, or you can create an iPad, or you can you know, create a virtual e-commerce site which is going to put all the insurance company out of business. What is that compelling vision? of tomorrow which is going to make you jump up and give up what is today and want to move to tomorrow. And the third is, what are those small little actions like Dandi March of Gandhi, like the famous speech of Martin Luther King, like the, the non-violence approach of, Martin, of uh, Nelson Mandela and the way he tolerated apartheid for so many years, what are the small steps do you take to move from point A to point B? Those are the three learnings from revolutions which, which we understood. So the first idea which came to our mind was, as I introduced to you, it's not innovation on what you do, which is important, but the innovation on how you do it could be the blue ocean thinking. The second idea is, if you want to bring about an institutionalized change, then you will have to do it in a form which is create dissonance with it today. That means risk <coughs> demotivation within the organization by saying you are, you have become irrelevant. It doesn't matter what you did in the past, you have become irrelevant. Create a, create a vision of tomorrow which is very compelling and then create catalyst actions from here to there. Those are the two concepts we have talked about till date. Now let's talk about the third concept. <clears throat> so the fact is that now that you are walking down the path of you want to innovate in how you want to run the company, you have to ask yourself a couple of very fundamental questions. Now to, to ask those fundamental questions, let me tell you a story. So the story is there are, you know, centuries ago or years ago or decades ago, there are two boys who started fighting. <clears throat> and they had these swords out or whatever, sticks out, and they're fighting with each other with huge, huge amount of beggar. And the reason they're fighting like all boys fight, they're fighting for a girl, right? Common girlfriend or whatever it is. And nobody asks the girl anyway, but, <clears throat> but they're fighting. And that's, you know, I'm sure you don't do that, but, you know, at least I used to do that quite a lot. So, so they're fighting with a great amount of passion. And then what happens is one of these boys gets tired and saying, he runs to his village and gets five of his brothers to come in and saying, you fight with me. So suddenly you have these six guys on one side, you've got one guy on the other side, and there's a fight which is going on again and again. And then this guy discovered, why am I fighting with six guys? He, he goes to his village and gets ten of his brothers. And now you have ten versus six, and they're fighting at all. In a week's time, every day the fight takes place. And today, you know, after a week or 10 days' time, you have 1,000 people on this side and 1,000 people on this side fighting with huge amount of passion. And why are they fighting? Nobody remembers, <laughs> right? But they're fighting. And there's so much, so much in our society around, around this whole thing. But they're fighting. Then what happens is suddenly, <clears throat> let's go back to those two people where the fight originated. So the first guy who started fighting suddenly realizes, right, the fact that only the only way to win is to fight more vigorously and he starts fighting with higher energy and goes in the front and saying, I want to lead and you know, he pushes his way right in the front and puts him, put himself in the harm's way and started fighting harder and harder. And then the second guy suddenly drops his sword and saying, you know what, there are 999 other people who are fighting like me. So should I be in the business of fighting or should I be in the business of something else? And he suddenly realizes that I should be in the business of actually organizing them, training them, you know, uh, enthusing them, enabling them, encouraging them, motivating them so that I can win. So that is the first time he dropped his sword and that is the first time in my philosophy a manager was born. Now, the reason the story is very important is, is the only way he could do all the things which he wanted to do was to drop the sword. Now today the problem is most managers want to be managers but they don't drop the sword. They keep holding the sword and still expecting to do a lot. Now the relevance of the story is very important as the manager was born. Now what happens is 30,000 kilometers away there was an entrepreneur who was born. And he heard the story. He heard the story of this man in a village who suddenly became a manager and could beat everybody and became ultimately the king of the, king of the land. 
So he started his company as brothers, sisters, mothers, friends, everybody worked together and slowly he became 999. He realized the same thing, he realized the sword and he, he dropped his sword, became a manager. While he became a manager and he, he became very interested and he says, I'll run the company like this, then he made the biggest mistake of his life. The biggest mistake of his life was to hire an HR manager, <laughs> right? So this is, this is very interesting and this is, this is the point of history where we started getting the organization structures wrong. So he hired the HR manager and said, you know what, it is your job to motivate the employee. It is your job to enthuse the employee. It is your job to take care of the employee. If the employee is unhappy, it is your job. I'm a manager, right? I'm going to enjoy all the benefits which are associated with being a manager, but all the jobs which are related to enthusing, encouraging, enabling the employee is with you, HR. And HR, because they wanted to create a job for themselves, they kept on expanding their roles and responsibility without realizing that actually their role and responsibility is to make this guy be a manager. So we suddenly started creating organization structures where the manager became manager and then he outsourced his job to the HR and then he made the biggest mistake. He picked up the sword and started fighting with his employees for credit, for, for everything. Because he had nothing better to do because he saw himself as a doer and called himself the manager and we got that story from which we wanted to learn completely wrong into this story. So that was very clear to us <coughs> of the fact that the manager should be in the business which he's not in today and the organization structures were, were defunct. There was another thing which is happening in the world which was very worrisome and it is still worrisome today. 50% of the global world population is less than 25 years old, 50%. Now, whether you like it or not, and there's some of you sitting out here, right, this population behaves differently. You know, I have been trained by this population because I have two teenagers and they train me every day, right? They can do six or seven things simultaneously. They will talk to you and they will message. You're nodding quite a lot, so you, you are also getting training every day. So, and, and, and they, their view of life and their view of working is very different to my generation view of working. I'm not saying who's right, who's wrong. You know, that I say only at, at home, who's right, who's wrong. But that also, my rights have been taken away right now. So because, you know, first time my son told, you don't understand that at time I knew that, you know, my days of glory are over. <coughs> so, and that's this, I don't know if you, you know, how many of you have heard this, chill dad, chill. You know, chill dad means shut up, you know. So anyway, so what was happening in this young, young generation is with 50% of the global population less than 25 years old, I saw a transformation happening in my house. From the command and control I, family which I come from, where my dad and my grandfather and grandmother used to tell me, do this, do that, and that is exactly what we used to do, to a house which was very collaborative, where my son and my daughter have the same amount of say as me and my wife have. Actually, they have more say. In, in what we do. Now the way I look, started looking at the unit of family, the only, we, only way we have been able to keep the unit of family intact and not allow it to broke, break is because we have given up the command and control structures in our family and moved away towards more collaboration. We tell our boys and girls that once, once you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, please come and share with us and we will collaborate with you. We will not pass judgment on you. We will not pass opinion on you, but have a conversation. And the biggest thing fathers and mothers say to their kids is, we are your friends. Now, if you're your friends, that means that we have equal voice. So there is what I call democratization of the family unit, which happened because of which the family units were largely kept in control and they didn't break up of the kind they would have broken up if we had kept command and control. But if you go to the organization, we have not changed anything. We continue to be autocratic. We continue to be democratic in thinking about our country. We continue to be very autocratic in our thinking about organizations. Now, the same kids are coming into our organizations and getting hugely suffocated because they want to collaborate, they want to partner. At the same time, when they come into the organization, they are structured into a pyramid structure, into an evaluation structure, into a structure which they are not used to, right or wrong. They are not used to and therefore they suffocate, they are not able to innovate. And we, kept tell, we keep telling them that you need to adopt yourself to the organization and the question I ask is, do they need to adopt to the organization or do the organization need to adopt to them? And the fact that in the family unit, we have adopted our family unit for our kids, do organization need to adopt to the kids rather than the kids adopting to the, 
to the organization, especially because the future is the kids. If 50 percent of the world population is them and it is ever increasing, then there is a need for revolution changes in the organization. So what are these changes? So we asked ourselves some fundamental questions. The first question is, what is the core business any company is in? And the answer is to create value for our customers. The more differentiated value you create for your customers, the higher you will grow. Okay. The second is, where does that value get created? And the answer to that question is that value gets created in the interface of your employees and the customer. That's a value zone. That's where the value gets created. Okay. Third question is, who creates this value? And the answer to that question is that the employees in the interface of you and your customers create the value which results into faster growth for your organization. And question number four then, hence what should the business of managers and management be? And the answer in my mind is very simple. The management and the managers obviously have to be in the business of enthusing, encouraging, enabling the employees in the value zone to create differentiated value for your customers so that you can grow faster. That resulted into a birth of employees first, customer second. So if you are in the business of enthusing, encouraging, enabling the, your employees so that they can create higher value for your customers in the value zone compared to your competitor, you will win hands down. So the concept was very clear. <clears throat> the concept was also very simple as most <coughs> new ideas are. The implementation was tough. How do you take a hierarchical, traditional, 32 years old company in 26 countries, 93 nationalities, 70,000 employees, and convert that from one way of thinking to another way of thinking. So there are four steps which we adopted to do that. Now before I go into four steps, it's very important for you to understand that whatever I'm saying or written in the book sounds very good in hindsight. In foresight, it was a huge number of experiments with 50, 60 percent of them failed and there are 40, 30 percent of them succeeded, and those 40, 30 percent of them appear in the book, the 60, 70 percent don't, right? So take it with a pinch of salt, and that's exactly what I have written in the book. Take it with a pinch of salt because it's from here onwards what I'm saying, the concept is clear from here onwards, it's a journey of experiment, and we do not know the proof point whether it works or not, and we will talk about proof points a little later. So the first thing which we did in this journey was <coughs> what we call the mirror mirror on the wall, understand the truth, create the dissonance which we talked about. So we brought in huge amount of, we, we did huge amount of work in the company to create 70,000 dissatisfied people with their current state of affairs and wanting to do something completely different. It was a huge risk to take and I would suggest that you should take that risk with yourself if you want to go anywhere in life or with your teams or with your organizations because that is the only, that's a start point of, of departing. And we did that, and we moved away from pride in our past to dissatisfaction with our current relative, you know, state of affairs, and, and get hyper about possibility of competition coming in. The second state is that, you know, if the soil is not ready, even if the best seeds you bring, the plant is not going to grow in. How do you create a culture which is ready for transformation? And that means a huge amount of trust which needs to exist between the employees and the organization. And if in absence of trust, irrespective of a great idea you have or whatever you want to do, it's not going to move the needle. And people are not going to move to make that happen. So once you are clear about that, how do you create trust? And there were multiple books and analysis we did, but one simple idea we came by pushing the envelope of transparency. So if you are honest, and if you share a lot, people will not distrust you because you have stretched the envelope of transparency to such an extent that people stop questioning you because all the information is there. So as we call it, there are lots of initiatives we took of washing dirty linen in public by giving information to our employees and their hence to our customers of the kind they didn't expect, the financial information, what are the areas which are wrong. So I run a UNI portal where any employee can, as an example, any employee can ask any question and I will answer those questions. The only rule is that all questions have to be, you know, you have to write your name, who you are as an employee when you ask the question, and I will give you an answer, but 100% of 70,000 employees will see all the questions 
and 100% of 75,000 employees will see all my answers. So it is, it is in, in public. When we launched this, everybody told me that nobody is going to ask you any dirty questions and they are only going to apply butter to you, you know, by putting their names because you are asking them to put their names. And I said, no, I think it's going to be different. 99% of the questions which are coming on the web today are all negative, right? It is about what is broken. 1% of the questions which come in have a positive comment about HCL, but 99% are negative and this is the fifth year running. So you wash a lot of dirty linen in public. You have open discussions about what is wrong with the company. You admit to those discussions. And therefore, you create an environment of trust. And then you create, go to the third layer. So you have now created trust. You're ready for transformation. How do you transform? One of the ways to transform, it is very important, is we have to create what I call democratization of the organization, as we have created in the family. You have to make the management equally accountable to the employees as the employees are accountable to the management. So how do you do that? So there are multiple ways to do that, but let me give you the conceptual framework and then one or two initiatives. The conceptual framework is the pyramid, which is where the employee is accountable to the management, is critical because we, we are in an era where you, know, you are responsible. You are responsible for whatever happens in the organization, and therefore it is important to have what I call the erect pyramid. But at the same time, you have to superimpose an inverted pyramid on top of it, where the management is equally accountable to the employees as the employees are accountable and create what I call a star organization. So the employee is accountable to the management, the management is accountable to the employees, and therefore you have a star organization. How do you create a star organization? As I said, to move from point A to point B, you know, you don't have to do too many things. There are some small catalyst actions which you can take to do that. One such catalyst action, and in the book there are many more catalyst action, was this whole use of 360 degree. 360 degree appraisal system is about getting feedback in a confidential basis from all the people around you so that it can help you improve. So that is what the instrument was meant to be, and it has been used extensively by a lot of companies. In most companies, it is ignored because of low participation, uh, low credibility, and uh, it's good to have and nice to ignore. That's, that's the system it is. We took that instrument and saying we're going to treat it purely as development initiative, and we're going to bring about some fundamental changes to that instrument. So the first change in the instrument is we're going to ask questions only with reference to value add, right? Not nice to know things about the fact that, about value add. The second is that we're going to open it to 70,000 people to rate anybody and ev everybody not in zones of control, that means there's got nothing to do with hierarchy, but zones of influence. For those of you who are working in organization, you know it is not your boss or subordinate who, cause, who is the main cause of problem or success, it is actually the one who is not in the zone of hierarchy, who is the cause of the problem or success. When you are in trouble, who do you go to talk to about your problems? Most likely it is not somebody in the hierarchy, it is somebody outside the hierarchy. So we moved away from what we call zones of control to zones of influence. And therefore, we said, OK, all 70,000 people can participate in a 360 degree survey of every, every single manager, including the CEO. Then we took the bold decision. The bold decision was that the results of the 360 degree appraisal, including mine, will be put on the web for all employees to see. Now, the reason we did that was, was with one single stroke, the fact that you can do an appraisal of a CEO and the fact that 100% of the people are going to be able to see it, move the power away from the corner office into the hands of employee notionally, right? But it was a big moment. You know, it's always small steps you take which create very large impact. Large steps you take create very small impact. 3,500 of my colleagues do exactly the same. Their 360 degree appraisal is done by all the employees and the results are pushed on the web by them for all the employees to see. So it is, so there are multiple such initiatives which did, which created what I call democratization of the organization. And then the last step. The last step was that it is very important when you do all this, that the employees feel that they are the owner of change. So transfer the ownership to the employees and the concept, what we call the destroy the office of the CEO. We said very clearly, looking up for answers is the wrong way of looking at it. Looking inward for answers is the right way of doing it. So how do we create more empowerment in organization, decision making in the front? So there are lots of initiatives which we did in transferring the ownership of change.
from the CEO and the manager down to the employees because that's exactly what we want. So what's the results? The results are, before I talk about the results, I, I believe the results are irrelevant. And the reason the results are irrelevant is because if the thought is good, the, if the results are not good, it is bad implementation. Because there is nothing illogical. I've talked in, at Howard, I've talked to, you know, I've talked at various places and various CEOs and various boards. I have not come across anybody who disputes the logic. You can dispute the way it is implemented, you can dispute the instrument, you can dispute whatever you want to dispute, but the, the, pure, the purity of logic cannot be disputed, at least I think so. So the result of HCL have been fantastic, right? The result is that we, from 2005 to 2010, suddenly from amongst the lowest growing IT services company have become the fastest growing IT services company. We were tested in recession, as every company was tested in recession. Do you really mean employee first, customer second during the recession? We said yes. Right? And we launched a, you know, a very successful experiment during recession. We said we will transfer the ownership of change and convert recession into an opportunity and not a threat. So we went back to our employees and saying, you know what, this is the best opportunity for us to demonstrate that collectively we can win. We are one of the few companies in the world, if not the only, which grew in recession. We grew 18% in financial year 09, we grew 24% in financial year 10. Most IT services companies globally degrew. We are one of the few companies which net headcount addition in UK and US alone with 1,500 people in, in, in the peak of crisis in financial year 2009 and much higher in financial year 2010. Our employee satisfaction surveys indicate we were rated number one in employee satisfaction across all industries at the peak of recession. Our customer satisfaction went up by 40% in financial year 2009 and by 26% in financial year 2010, all during peak of recession. So imagine that the customer whose budget is going down is taking money out of other vendors because there is no new money coming in and giving it to you. Why is he doing that? And when I ask the number of customers to why they're doing it, they are saying very thing. The enthusiasm in the eyes of your employees, the passion they demonstrate for the work, the, the, the lack of ambiguity in their mind as to what is going to happen with their jobs and the empowerment they have to take decisions which are in benefit for me is the reason I have taken the money away from one vendor and giving it to the other vendor. I just want to summarize here and I, <clears throat> I just want to conclude by saying the following. I think we have to, we are in a position today that we will be challenged by many things, emerging economy, changing demographic profiles, changing consumer behaviors, digitization. Every single company, which at least I deal with, and I deal with a lot of companies, are becoming obsolete because their business models are obsolete and their, their way of working is obsolete and the amount of spend they have put in IT to, to get them ready to digital age is obsolete. The whole mobility, the whole, you know, there are a huge amount of trend changes which are happening of the kind and scale and size we've never seen before in public services, in government, in NGOs, in private, private companies. Innovation is the only way out of this position. The only way the innovation work is, unfortunately, they still have not discovered machines which can innovate. So human beings have to innovate. It is thus important, if you want to succeed, to find ways of putting human being back in business, to put human being at the center stage of your innovation. It could be employee first, it could be something else, but you have no choice, in my mind, but to put human being back in business. Ours was one experiment. I'm sure you're going to discover your own experiments. Thank you so much. Well, um, challenge has been put down. Lots of questions were asked. Uh, you asked lots of questions in the beginning. Maybe it's time um, for you to uh, ask them more individually. We've got... Uh, guys around here with microphones, and I'll take questions now. Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, one second. That's it. Firstly, thank you very much for a very enlightening um, presentation. How did your shareholders react to your transformation? You know, uh, the first question somebody asks is how do customers react? Then let me ask and answer that question. I truly believe that customers are amongst the smartest group of people. And all these golf playing CEOs and CEOs who sign on behalf of napkins over dinner and drinks, 
their age and day is gone. The customer is very clear, at least in our business, that what he's buying is a group of very intelligent, very innovative, very motivated people who should be enabled by the organization. That's what he's buying. So my answer is that the customer sees employee first as the way the management is saying that I'm not going to be the hand of God who's going to prevent my employee to deliver what is best for you. I think there's an ego, I'll switch this off. But I'm going to be in the business of, of making my employee deliver to you. Now, therefore, the customers get it, and that's the impact of revenue, revenue and profit growth. As far as the shareholder concern is concerned, they were the most concerned when I talked about this, because as somebody said, what happened to your bottom line? Because everybody assumes employee first, customer second is about pizza parties, holidays, higher leaves, and it's got nothing to do with that. It's about making people who want to play their hearts out to run a sub-10 second race, giving them the opportunity to run a sub-10 second race. It is not about the pizza party. So shareholders initially didn't get it because we communicated wrongly. Today they love it. I mean, our market cap is twice as much as it was in 2005. We, we grew 58 or 59 percent sequentially last year on a stock market. So shareholders love it. So once you get it, there is nothing like success. So since it is successful, everybody loves it. But in the end, employee first, customer second, I keep saying employee first, customer second is not about love for employees. It is that human, putting humans being back in business is the only way you can outperform others. It's a pure business strategy decision. And that will result into better benefits for customers and better, better benefits for shareholders. Sir, um, I do not know if uh, employees first and customer second philosophy of SEL is in public within the customer. And uh, I want to know, so putting customer in second place has any impact on SEL business? Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought I'd spend the last half an hour talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> business, yeah, I, I just explained to you, SEL business is growing. You see, you must understand that if the teachers at LSC do not say students first, right? If they, if, let's just, let's just take this forward, right? If they come and, if every teacher in LSC comes and talks about what are the five things you want to learn today, and teaches only those five things, and maybe those are the five wrong things, the reception to that ideas and the retentivity of those ideas in your mind would be far more than the fact that he or she teaches what he or she wants or assumes that you want to learn. I think employee first, customer second is about that, understanding what does the customer want. The customer wants to enthuse, enable the employees who are working on his project. You're working on a complex digital project, right? You're taking a publishing company and you're making it an e-commerce company. Now who's working on it? There may be 50, 100 very bright people working on it. So what the customer expects that these 50, 100 people, you as an organization, please take care of them. Because they are the people who are, who are delivering the core value for me. Please take care of them. Please make sure they have the tools, they have the training, they have the knowledge, they have the resources, so that they can make me an e-commerce company. That's what the customer wants. So the customer always knows that as far as he's concerned, it's like flying in an airline, right? 777, you're flying, you're flying with, in American Airlines and I'm flying with Singapore Airlines, right? My experience going towards Singapore and your experience of going towards Chicago is very different. Same earlier. Why? Because one set of employees feel one way, another set of employees feel another way. And what do you want while you are in the airline? You're saying, please, American airline, take care of your employees. That's what you would say. Right? So that's, that's a difference. So customers always get it. The fact that they say HCL now gets it, let's throw more business at them. Gentleman right at the back. First of all, thank you very much indeed for a fantastic presentation. Uh, just two questions, if I can. Um, number one, your own 360-degree feedback, uh, or is there any revelations or shocks in that? Um, and from a chief executive perspective, what do you think is the key skill 
having got that feedback. And question number two, um, in terms of transformation, obviously, if you're a low-performing company and you want to turn into the market leader, I can understand creating dissonance, as you call it. But if you are already market leader, should you create dissonance and cannibalize yourself in that thinking? So would this work if you're already market leader and doing very well? I think two very, very nice questions. So yes, it was shock. My 360 was a shock. It depends upon my, to me or to, to people who gave it. I don't know. I always knew myself. Uh, so, it's very interesting that I've been doing this 360 degree for the last five years now at, at this mass scale. I've been, doing, I've been doing open 360 degree from year 2003, uh, sorry, from year 1993. So, with the smaller group of... Let me go back. As an entrepreneur, when you start up, right, it is open 360 degree, right? You, you <laughs> come together as friends and you're open to criticism, you tell each other the way you feel in the face, and that's how entrepreneurs really create great corporations. It's only when great corporation, when entrepreneurs get converted into corporations and the corporations start running with professional managers that we completely, you know, blow it up. So my 360 degree, each year has thrown different things. You don't have a vision, you have poor articulation, you have poor execution skills, you don't, you know, whatever, you, your compelling vision is not communi communicated well, you don't have empathy, whatever it is. So, Different aspects of the year, different things break up, come up, and which tells me two things. One, it's genuine weakness which I have, or it is weakness in communication which I have. Whichever one it is, I have to solve it, and I have to overcome. And the fact that now you know it, and I know it, you know that I know it, I think the ability to get it done is much easier. And that's a, that's a huge power of 360 degree, huge power. And you acknowledge it and saying, okay, I'm going to work on it. And you, you judge me the fact that I'm going to work on it. It's like a disease, right? You have a stomachache. You're very clear that the doctor is going to give you a medicine. It is either going to cure stomachache or it's not going to cure stomachache. It's one zero. And that's what 360 degree does. I think what is the key skill in a, in a, in a, in a CEO of today? I would believe that God has given us two years and one month for a purpose. Right? It is very important for you to understand that the growth is in emerging markets, the value equation for the dollar you pay is changing dramatically, the demographic profile is changing, the buying patterns are changing. You sitting in your corner office, it is impossible for you to take all the right decisions. So if you can democratize your organization and help people take the right decisions at the right levels, who are right in front of the employees, you know, we created this innovation business unit. It was very interesting. And uh, I, I was reading this manual within our company. For everything, there is a manual. You know how IT services companies are, right? So there is a manual that if you have a bright idea, you put it in this portal, you put this financial, financial thing, you put PPT, Excel sheet, get it validated by the finance guy. It comes to the board. The board evaluates it. If they like it, they're going to give you the $10 million for your innovation idea. And the first thing I said is, if there is an innovation idea, the best thing about it is you don't know. You have an intuition. If you can convert that into PPT and Excel sheet, you're forcing that guy to lie through his teeth. Because if he knew, somebody would have already, already executed it. So you're forcing him to go to Google, right, do something, just outsmart you by outsmarting your knowledge, and then get your $10 million, and then he'll go back and do exactly what he wanted to do. You unnecessarily wasted six months of irrelevant time in making inno innovation doesn't happen in that fashion. So I believe the biggest skill of a CEO today is to understand his own limitations, understand his own irrelevance, and understand that he is in the business, some, some good concepts like servant leadership have been written about. Understand that very clear, and understand, you know, if I always tell a story, Maradona one day was dreaming, right? And he says that I need to, he saw himself winning the World Cup for Argentina. He woke up in the morning wanting to win World Cup for Argentina, and then fortunately he had a full length mirror in his house. He saw it, he understood that he can't play, he needs to become a coach. Most CEOs don't have that full length mirror in front of them, right? They don't see the fact that they need to be coached, they can't play, and that's, you know, that's one thing which I think we all need to learn every day. The, the second question is, if you're already a market leader, do you need to transform? I, I would say no. I would say that you have to, you have to think very carefully about your position in the industry and your point A. And that point A is changing every day. I keep saying, what is Google? 
Is Google a publishing company? Is Google a technology company? Is Google a retail company? Is Google an advertising company? Is Google a telecommunication company? So how can you say as an AT&T or as a Reader Digest or a Financial Times that your position is not being challenged by a smart guy coming around? You take insurance companies. The fact the number of insurance companies on the net, the kind of services they are giving to, take, take pub, public services companies out here. You know, a lot of word, words are being written in UK about public services companies, about number of jobs which will be outsourced in public service company. Yeah, they have, they should be outsourced because they, you know, the way to deliver services to all of, all of us is self-help services, not call center services. The call centers were written 10 years ago. So the, the question, in my mind is, if you are already market leader, if you believe you can stay there, you don't need to transform. But if you believe there is somebody out there, not your doing, but somebody out there can outsmart you, and you can see IBM today, you can see Cisco today, you can see Microsoft today, you can see very large GE today, you can see very large companies who were exceptionally good, even three, four years ago, getting hugely threatened by what everybody else is doing, and that's the reason you, you have to be worried. It's coming. Thank you. Um, I'm interested to know whether the design and organization of the physical workplace has featured at all in your employees' ideas and visions about the way of transforming your organization. I was very fascinated when I went to Apple first. <clears throat> the fact that Steve Jobs made design, I don't know if you know that, right? So the way the Apple offices are designed is that all facilities, canteen and everything, is right in the center of the building. And then the offices are, you know, around. So therefore, he, his emphasis is on people coming together. So when they come to use the facilities, they come together and therefore crowd together and therefore create collaboration and do all that stuff. Now, our, my view on that is that, and I, I'm sorry I'm obsessed with this Generation Y, my view is that my son and daughter have chat with each other from two rooms in my house, and that is how they know what dad said and mom said. I mean, the moment I get out one room and go to the other room, I already know that we are going out, whatever it is. If this is the way they collaborate, I, who am I to create workplace, you know, where you can sit and have a coffee together? That's not the way. They are instant messaging, they're instant collaborating in a very different way. So we have created a digital presence for everybody. One of the things we've done well is that every single employee should needs to participate in his work life and his other life. Other life is you may be excited about music, about cooking, about social work, about education, about health, about anything. So we create, we help like schools, right? When you come to a school, the interesting part of the school is that you are educated, but you are part of multiple societies. You're part of multiple but, so that's, that learning from the school, I don't know why, we don't take it to our organization. We don't have clubs, we don't have all this stuff, and therefore the organization becomes very boring because we are so goddamn dull and boring and only about, worried about revenues and money. And we do not understand that these kids have come from a different, so we have created a huge amount of digital presence and digital participation so that you know, people want to participate more. That's the work culture which we are investing in, not the physical work culture. Thanks. Um, I, haven't, I haven't read your book, so I'm not sure if this is answered in there, but, but the title of it suggests that there's some kind of tension between um, the, the wishes of the employees and the wishes of the customers. Um, and you said earlier that often the customers will realize that the, the best thing to do is to empower employees, but I'm interested, are there situations where the two um, sets of interests come into conflict? Um, are there some examples of those kind of things um, and what happens in those situations? You know, the customer says, I want this, and the employee <coughs> says, I don't, think, I don't think that you should have that. Um, what's the company line then? So, uh, first is a very interesting question, right? Uh, I mean, this, the first part of your question was very interesting. The second part, I, I'll come to. The question is that <laughs> what, if you do not say something second, how can something be first? I'm sorry I'm going to use this example, but you cannot go and say to two or three girls, I love you, I love you too, I love you too. 
Somebody, someday you have to say, before, just the day before you get, get married. It took me seven years to get married, but it's still okay. You know, I said for seven years, I said only to one girl, I love you, but there was a father-in-law, so you know how this goes. The, the issue is that you have to make up your mind, what is your core business? And therefore, the reason we wanted to say customer second was to send an unambiguous message within the company, not outside the company. Because this is an internal slogan. The book title is based, you know, we did employ first customer second for transformation. We didn't do it to write a book. So unfortunately, the book has this title because Harvard thought that, you know, that's the best thing to do, which I don't, that this business I don't understand, fortunately. So employee first, customer second, the internal slogan of our, our campaign was critical so that nobody hides behind what the customer wants. So therefore, in any initiative you want to take, my always believe, and that's always I do, while you say what is important, please also say what is not important. It is shutting doors which will get you to the destination, not opening doors. If you know what doors to shut, doors will open for you. If you only focus on opening doors, you will always be opening the wrong doors. The second question to your thing is that, the second part of that question is that the employee first, customer second, took us in a different direction. We went to the customer and saying, you know what, if this guy is the most important, right, for you and for me, uh, this is what I'm gonna do. Tell me what are you gonna do? So today in employee first, customer second, the customers come and participate in a way which is never heard of before. They come and talk about their vision to the employees. They have open houses with the employees. We have a value portal, so employees participating, giving, giving ideas. The customer rate them, rank them, give points to them so that you can buy bikes and you know, whatever, watches and, and things like that. So suddenly, because of this whole, the customers have also been drawn in. So now the employee is right in the middle of both customers and the management. And therefore, this, this concept is taking you know, better and better shape. Hi there. Uh, you mentioned Generation Y. And um, as someone who manages um, some very bright, capable, but overall exceptionally impatient bright minds, how, how, can you give some thoughts about how you get that marriage between experience, longevity, that things do take time, even Facebook apparently, and then how do you actually get people to be productive in that? Uh, it, it takes me, and what back, are you from industry or are you from education? I'm a management consultant. Okay. Can I ask so, you who your main competitors are as well? <laughs> So my, my, my view is like this. My view is there is knowledge, there is application. And knowledge needs no experience. And most of the people who are experienced hide behind knowledge. So one of the ways to democratize the organization which we have done is to have some very strong knowledge management systems. So once you have knowledge management systems, you take away the power of so-called application or experience, knowledge goes away, everybody has. So all projects which we do is available to employees, there is e-learning, This all that stuff is there. Now experience definitely comes in from an application point of view and that is something you cannot capture, you can, you know, that's something you cannot take away. And that is the kind of people we really want. So people who can take what I call event correlation people, people who can take unrelated events, correlate them, and come to a conclusion, which is very different than the conclusion you and me will come to, is experience. So we are redefining experience, and that is the journey which we are walking in. You cannot take away the merits of experience. Now, the reason I said Generation Y, for a different reason, <clears throat> if you want to grow as we want to grow, at 40% year on year is the way we want to grow, and we hired 8,000 people last quarter, 7,000 people the quarter before. So you're hiring a huge number of people. Now, the raw material you're hiring, you like it or not, is young people. Now, that's a raw material available. Now, if that's a raw material available, you have to construct your organization to consume that raw material in the appropriate fashion to get the best out of them. So it is not saying that experience doesn't matter. It is to say that if this is the raw material coming in, in the volumes which you want, 
then you have to convert your organization which gets the maximum out of this raw material. So these are two separate problems we have to deal with. And attrition in HCL after implementing this philosophy? So two brilliant questions. Uh, first is, were the employees unhappy and how did I convert them and attrition? First is, you are assuming that they are happy today. I would not make that assumption. <laughs> See, happiness is a state of mind, right? It's like, uh, it's like marriage. You, you know, it's, it's, it's a state of mind whether you are happy or you're not happy. I, I believe that one of the things the employees expect from you is honesty. And uh, the honesty is the fact that do you, Vineet, believe that we are doing all it takes uh, to empower, enthuse, or whatever, be fair to employees, and the answer to that in 2005, which I gave to them, is no. That we are not doing everything which is required uh, to deliver a fair service from the organization to the employee so that he can create the value. So, one of the reasons I think the change took place in 2005 is an honest admission of the fact that we were not doing what needs to be done. I do an event called Directions where I meet all employees. So I spend one and a half months walking the world, meeting them face to face, like we are doing 2,000, 3,000 people together. And I just finished that, right? And there was only two, two more stations left. And I asked this, I, they asked the same questions and I, I gave the same answer. The answer is no. So the answer is that if you can honestly admit to the employees of what is broken in the organization and what is fixed in the organization, you start having a conversation which is meaningful. And that's something which we have done honestly in HCL because, and I always say that we are broken in perpetuity, right? We, we will never be fixed. So if you think that we will deliver world-class services, uh, you have to go and join Zippos, right? But, you know, not, not us. The other story which is very important for me is the fact that if you take an Indian, and let me give you an example, right? And I was, I was talking about this at the World Economic Forum. You understand how an Indian mind is wired. He gets up in the morning and he decides that he's going to draw $500, 500 rupees of cash from ATM so that he can pay for whatever, song down, download an iPod or whatever it is. He gets up in the morning, he goes and picks up his bike it's quite possible the bike is punctured, right? And then he gets onto the bike and starts traveling. There is a high probability that somebody, a rickshaw puller or something, goes and bangs his bike. Then there is equal probability that he is going to go into one of the potholes and his bike will get stuck and he has to leave the bike there itself. And then after all this, he reaches the ATM and there is a quite a high probability that the ATM doesn't work. And even if the ATM works, there's a high probability that he doesn't have the cash, which is assumed that he has the cash, right? Despite all this, most Indians at most time are able to draw their 500 bucks somehow, and it works. And the reason it works is because they are neither concerned about the pothole, they're neither concerned about the puncture, they're neither concerned about the state of the country or the state of the rickshaw puller or the state of the ATM, they're focused on their 500 bucks. So what I tell my employees in the organization is, we are broken in perpetuity. If you want to join a company which is, which is squeaky clean, we are the wrong place. We are focused on our 500 rupees. We want to move from point A to point B. We will fix things. There will be more potholes closed this year than they were last year. But we will, we will, we will, we will clean, the, clean them up. So we, we do not make the wrong promise. We make the right promise. And therefore, honesty and integrity in your communication is very critical because if you promise something and don't deliver it, they will not, never forget in life. The second proposition to our, to our employees is the fact that, you know, a diamond cutter gets excited about rough diamonds, not polished diamonds. A potter gets excited by rough clay, not finished pots. So if you want to join HCL and we are enthusing, empowering, enabling you and giving you the playing, playing fields, and you are excited about polished diamonds and finished pots, then HCL is the wrong place. We are looking for people who will change HCL. We are looking because the transformation ownership have taken place. So that's, that's the way we handle, handle this. So we, we try very hard to improve our employee services and come up with innovation. We, we must be amongst the best in the world doing that. 
but we never claim it to our employees because our employees know it and you ha just have to go to my UNI site to see that there are more things broken in HCL than we have fixed last year. The second thing is attrition. I would say, before I give you the answer, it is the most irrelevant data, which whoever, whoever came up with, you know, needs to be expunged from the management books. Most people, by quoting attrition data, which is the lowest in Europe and US, forget that it is not the problem of how many people go away, but what is happening to the people who are staying back? The demotivation level of people who are staying back is the problem. The people who are gone are no more your problem. So I prefer higher iteration to a demotivated workforce with lower iteration. So we measure what we call passion index, not satisfaction index. And lastly, our iteration is the lowest in industry. And it has gone down sequentially from you know, 2005 every quarter for the last you know, so many quarters. But that is not, that's not, you know, so fortunately because the statistics look good for me, I can make this statement. But the statistics look, maybe that's the reason I'm making this statement. So when the statistics look bad, so attrition is not the way to do it. Satisfaction is not the way to do it. Passion is the right way of measuring it. And focusing on employees who are inside the company is the way to do it, rather than worrying about why are people leaving the company. As long as, as long as few good men or women stay in your company and are had hugely, hugely passionate about what they are doing with you, you will win. It doesn't matter how many people come and go. Well, uh, Vineet, um, you've um, given us a lot to think about. You've, uh, I think, inspired us. You've given us some, some really very interesting stories and parables. Um, on behalf of the whole audience, I'd like to thank you very much indeed thank for you. uh, your contribution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to give you a very a small memento from uh, the Trium uh, organization for this. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>